Hello and thank you for watching my video. My name is Astrid Krasnishi. I'm CCNA and CCMP certified instructor. And this video is CCNA Semester 3 Scaling Network, Chapter 4, Wireless LAN. We are moving to Section 4.3, so this is Part 3, Wireless LAN Security. Now a WLAN is open to anyone within the range of an access point and the appropriate credential to associate to it. With the wireless net network interface card and a knowledgeable of cracking techniques, an attacker might not have the to physically enter the workplace to gain access to our WLAN. Wireless networks are specifically susceptible to several threats including wireless intruder, unauthorized user attempting to access network resources, the solution is to the chair loss, rogue access point, unauthorized access point installed by a well-intentioned or user or willing for uh, malicious, interception of data, man in the middle attack, DOS attack, WLAN services can be compromised either accidentally or for malicious intent, various solutions exist depending on the source of denial of service. Denial of service attack, wireless denial of service attack can be the result of improperly configuring devices, configuration errors can disable the WLAN, a malicious user intentionally interfering with a wireless communication, accidental interference, WLAN operates in the unli unlicensed frequency band and therefore all, all wireless network, regardless of security features, are prone to interference from other wireless devices. Accidental interference may occur from such devices as a microwave oven, cordless phones and baby monitors and a lot more. All these devices can interfere with our uh, wireless network and by creating denial of service attack. The 2.4 GHz band is more prone to interference than 5 GHz band. Management frame DOS attack. Management frame denial of service attack. Although unlikely a malicious user could intentionally initiate a denial of service attack using radio frequency jamming device that produce accidental interference. Now radio frequency jamming devices they used to use on the wall. But it is likelier that they will attempt to manipulate management frames to consume the access point resources and keep channel too busy to service legitimate user traffic. Management frames can be manipulated to create various type of denial of service attack. Two common management frame attack include a spoof disconnect attack. This occur when an attacker sends a series of dissociate commands to all wireless client within the basic service set area. A clear to send flood, this occurs when an attacker takes advantage of carrier sense multiple access collision avoidant contention method to monopolize the bandwidth and deny all other wireless client access to the access point. So first we have a disconnect attack which says okay the, the um, attacker will send loads of dissociate uh, uh, frames so everybody will dissociate with the access point. And the second type of attack is clear to send, where the attacker will send clear to send frames to every wireless client. Rogue access points. A rogue access point is an access point of wireless router that has either been contacted to a corporate network without explicit authorization and against corporate policy, connected or enabled by an attacker to capture client data, such as the MAC address of the client, both wireless and wired or to capture data packets. Another consideration is how easy it is to create a personal network hotspot. For example, a user with the secure network access enables the authorized Windows host to become a Wi-Fi access point. To prevent the installation of rogue access points, organization might use monitoring software to actively monitor the radio spectrum for unauthorized access points. Man-in-the-middle attack, one of the more sophisticated attacks a malicious user can use is called man-in-the-middle attack. A popular wireless MITM attack is called evil twin, evil twin access point attack, where an attacker introduces a rogue access point and configures it with the same secure set identified as a legitimate access point. Location offering free Wi-Fi such as airport, cafes and restaurants are hotbed for this type of attack due to the open authentication. Connecting wireless client will see two access points offering wireless access with the same name. Those 
near the rogue access point find the stronger signal and most likely associated with the evil twin access point. User traffic is now sent to the rogue access point, which in turn captures the data and forwards it to the legitimate access point. So it will capture the data from the users and it will forward it to the legitimate access point so the users don't even know that there's, there's an attack happening. So security has always been a concern with the Wi-Fi because the network boundary has moved. Wireless signal can travel through solid matter such as ceiling, floor, walls, outside of the home or office space. Without string security measures in place, installing a WLAN can be equivalent of putting Ethernet ports everywhere, even outside. Imagine you put an Ethernet port everywhere in the street and anyone can just plug in and get access to you. Well, that's what you're doing with the wireless network. To address the threats of keeping wireless intruders out of the protect uh, and protecting the data, two early security features were used. First, we had SSID cloaking. Access point and some wireless routers allow the SSID beacon frame to be disabled, so we're not sending this beacon advertising what's our network's name. Wireless clients must manually identify the SSID to connect to the network, so they must manually find type with the name of the network, or the name is SSD, SSID. MAC address filtering, an administrator can manually allow or deny clients wireless access based on the physical MAC address. So you can deny or allow, you say, okay, this MAC address, this wireless MAC address is allowed, and this wireless MAC address is allowed, and that's it. Although these two features would deter most users the, or attackers, the reality is that the neither SSID cloaking or MAC address filtering would deter a crafty intruder. Best way to secure a wireless network is to use authentication and encryption systems. Two types of authentication were introduced with the original 802.11 standard. Open system authentication. Any wireless client should easily be able to connect and should only be uh, used in situations where security is of no concern, such as in location providing free internet access like cafes, hotels, and remote areas. So in open authentication, no password is required. Any willing client can associate ideal for provider free internet access. And then we have a shared key authentication, which provides a mechanism such as WEP, WPA, or WPA2 to authenticate and encrypt data between a wireless client and access point. However, the password must be pre-shared between both parties to connect. There are three shared key authentication techniques available. First, we have a Wired Equivalent Privacy, or WEP. The original 802.11 specification, designed to provide a privacy similar to connecting to a network using a wired connection. The data is secured using the RC4 encryption method with a static key and that's the problem we have a static key however the key never changes when exchanging the packet making it easy to hack you should never use in WEP then we have a Wi-Fi protected area or WPA a Wi-Fi aligned standard that uses web but secures the data with a much stronger temporary key integrity protocol TKIP encryption algorithm so what happened is WEP is called wired equivalent protection which said, okay, well, it's as protected as wire devices, but that's not true because the key is static and with every packet you can, after a while, you can get the key. Now, they saw that that's not good. So the, the Wi-Fi alliance, they came up with a new standard, like a stub gap standard. So they took this web key and they secured it with a much stronger uh, encryption algorithm. TKIP changes the key for each packet, making it much difficult to uh, hack. 802.11i or WPA2 I, IEEE 802.11i is the industry standard for securing wireless network. This is the most secure method. It uses AES for encryption. Wi-Fi Alliance version is called a WPA2. 802.11i and 802.WPA2 both use the advanced encryption standard AES for encryption. AES is currently considered the strongest encryption protocol personal security mode for the best performance. Encryption is used to protect the data. If an intruder has captured encrypted data, 
they would not be able to decipher it in any reasonable amount of time. The IEEE 802.11i and Wi-Fi Alliance WPA and WPA2 standard use the following encryption protocol. So we have a temporal key integrity protocol, TKIP. TKIP is an encryption method used by WPA. It provides support for legacy WLAN equipment by addressing the original flaws associated with the 802.11 WEP encryption method. It makes use of WEP but encrypts the layer 2 payload using TKIP and carries out the message integrity check in the encrypted packet to ensure the message has not been tampered with. And the latest one, we have advanced encryption standard. AES is the encryption method used by WPA2. It is a preferred method because it aligns with the industry standard 802.11i. AES performs the same function as TKIP but it has a far stronger method of encryption. It uses a counter cipher mode with a block chaining mo message authentication code protocol that allows destination hosts to recognize if the encryption and non-encrypted bits have been tampered with. Always use or choose WPA2 with AES when possible. So authenticating a home user, WPA and WPA2 support two types of authentication. Personal, intended for home or small office network user authenticate using a pre-shared key, PSK. Wireless client authenticate with the access point using a pre-shared password. No special authentication server is required. Or we have an enterprise. In enterprise, is intended for enterprise network but requires a remote authentication dial-in user services or RADIUS authentication server. Although more complicated setup, it provides additional security. The devices must be authenticated by the RADIUS server and the user must be authenticated using 802.1x standard which uses the extensible authentication protocol EEP for authentication. To authenticate in the enterprise, in the network that have a stricter security requirement an additional authentication or login is required to grant wireless client such access. The enterprise security mode choice choices require authentication, authorization and accounting a AAA radio server. Fields are necessary to supply the access point which the required information to contact the a AAA server. Radio server IP address. This is the reachable address of radio server. Radio port numbers. Officially, officially signed by UDP port 1812 for radius authentication and 1813 for radius accounting. But this can also operate on UDP port 1645 and 1646. Thank you very much for watching. I uh, hope to see you in a future video on part 4, 4.4 wireless LAN configuration. Thank you very much and bye bye.